Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. Uh, we've got a cracker for you this time around, I can assure you. A cracker with 100,000 people in attendance. And Tim, Tim Vickery in Rio. I, I would argue that the, the greatest injustice in football against a 17-year-old <laughs> in a cup <laughs> final was done during this match. It was shocking. Oh, wasn't and it just? The, the BBC commentator was almost in tears at the injustice of only getting a free kick and one yellow card for the biggest crime in footballing history against a 17-year-old. Yeah, little squeaky voice, me. Paul Allen, bearing down on goal from all of the years and he was a he was a, a wonderful trier uh and a, and a good little player but from all the years of watching him at tottenham i can more or less guarantee that from any promising situation paul allen would have find, found a way to win a corner from it so it probably would have been a save from jennings and a corner for for west ham but we never got the chance to know did we willie willie young well i'm so pleased uh to invite onto into this conversation somebody who knows a lot more about it than we do and probably has a lot more skin in the game or definitely has in that regards Sheka Bhatia welcome to the Shirtname nice podcast to yeah and to introduce you as well as uh, being a West Ham fan uh, through and through and through and through and through and through for your sins yeah. <laughs> but you're also a journalist, um, and am, not just yeah. a and not just a sports journalist, but a news journalist as well. Yeah, I'm part of and news journalist. I cover sport as well. Yeah, and the author. He's of working for the Daily Mail. It's a steady job, but he wants to be a paperback writer. Is he your, is your comedian? <laughs> he's he, he's he's Laurel to my Hardy, genuinely. Yeah, okay. But yeah. uh, on this occasion, I eat more than him. <laughs> anyway, uh, Sheka, it's also interesting to speak to you because you've just put out a book, haven't you? The is it Namast Giza? Namaste Giza. Namaste Giza. Yeah, which yeah tells about my me being obviously my parents is from the east, and uh, I'm an East Ender through and through. So so it's the two come together. So many of the Asian um, of, of our generation, and I think younger, but certainly of, of our generation, were into football. But during this time, and we're going back to the FA Cup final of, of 1980, uh, West Ham and Arsenal, but during this time, you didn't see them in stadiums. They didn't feel safe in stadiums. And all of that was thoroughly, thoroughly understandable. So almost all of them that I knew grew up even in London, East End or South Hall, they grew up either, either as Man United or Liverpool fans. Hmm. Something that wasn't close. Your situation is entirely different, isn't it? Yeah, because I'm in the heartland of the East End and uh, obviously going to school. I mean, I don't remember the 66 World Club, 66 World Cup, even I'm too young to remember it, but I do remember the stories that came out after it. And uh, being at school in the East End, there were a lot of West Ham fans. There were Arsenal and Tottenham. My misguided brother is a Tottenham fan. Um, but, um, you know, I, I grew up loving West Ham. And, you know, as I say in the Mustang Giza, the book, I, I suffered quite a lot. I missed a lot of goals. Just being scared because at that age, you don't understand why skinheads want to beat you up or why they'll call you the P word or curry muncher or all the other racial offensive terms, you know. So I used to shake and hide and run to the toilets and very difficult especially when i grew up and as a teenager learned actually what this was all about you know this is more about their, them being hating themselves i think rather than hating me you know jealousy and all that kind of stuff why did you do this to yourself you know you, you don't have to put yourself in these in these situations yeah you did I, think, I mean i don't know what football, football teams you support i mean brazil is my international team actually but um i am um, it's like a virus football west ham if you love your team and I want to be an equal. I'm not a victim. I'm not lesser than those guys. I hope I've grown up to be clever enough to talk my way out of situations now. But in those days, it was um, literally I used to see knives and you know and, and police being attacked and the poor Asian women in Green Street having their stores overturned, you know, before the matches and the sea cows and all that rubbish stuff that they didn't even understand what Nazis Nazis were about themselves. I mean, some you know, as a kid when you hit, when we played Spurs. By the way, I never had any money, so I used to have to go in until I could afford it. I got a job in the supermarket, 10 minutes from the end, everybody's coming out, and I'm like a salmon going up river. And inevitably, 
the referee blow the whistle. <laughs> but those 10 minutes, but I never understood when we played against Spurs where they would hiss continually the whole time. And to my horror, I found out that they were, you know, taking the mickey out of the gas chambers, you know. So horrific stuff underlying the whole thing. But I don't think they were clever enough to understand how much they hated themselves and how much hate was within them. Um, I can't forgive them. I can't forget them. But I, I'm, I'm okay. I mean, I'm a, I'm a good runner as well. So I've run a few marathons. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not a that, that, that explains some gold records in the Olympics, by the way. But anyway, that aside, and I'm sure it didn't help when there was a series of skinhead books, for want of a better way of uh, phrasing it, in the early 1970s, written by Richard Allen. We'll come, we'll come to that, I'm sure, mm. during this conversation. I hope so, anyway. But I think we have to explain the landscape of the East End. The East End, for those who don't know, until pretty recently, has always been um, the East End of London, this is, has always been uh, very much a, a haven for new immigrants. And that goes back, you know, hundreds of years, actually. When I was growing up, the East End of London um, was still very white, still very white Cockney, but there was a lot of Jewish immigrants still who had come from the beginning of the 20th century and then by the time um certainly in the 70s you started seeing the appearance of asian people on the streets there were communities from what i remember but very small communities have i got that landscape right or do you experience yeah, it I differently so. I, mean, I think so i mean i think uh, when i was at school I, I banded with the black guys because we were a minority we used to play football blacks against the whites, but I always felt there were more black people to answer your question than Asian people. And I think that's a lot to do with the, the Windrush generation who came in collectively, whereas Asians came in family separately. Of, of course, Idi Amin kicked out a lot of Asians from Uganda in 72, I think. So there was a large increase then, but I always felt we were, no disrespect to the black community, but we were lesser, lesser visible than, than, the, the, and than the black community. And also certainly we didn't have the framework to band together Whereas I felt my black mates, West Indian mates, did. They had the support of each other. So I was very much a loner, uh, not only going to football, but going to school, going to college, you know, being bullied, all that kind of stuff. Always being the outsider. Maybe that's got something to do with my personality, but I, I always felt that I was an outsider. And, and crucially, black East Enders. I have several friends who went to Upton Park School, for example, mm. and... Um, Sorry, it's not. It's Upton House. Is it Upton House? Is it called? I think this. I don't know. Yeah, no. uh, Upton House. Don't don't worry. Anyway, they they were more accepted as football fans at Upton Park than Asian people. It's kind of a weird thing here. And when I look at, back at some of the images, I remember well the likes of Cass Pennett, for example, one of the or the first convicted football hooligan as he was then, book publisher, etc., as he is now. Mm. But mm. I remember that there was this, it wasn't as much in North London, in uh, going to Arsenal or going to White Hart Lane, but I do remember thinking, or it wasn't as evident maybe, but I do remember thinking, going to Upton Park, that there were a lot of Asian people around outside the ground but like tim says inside the ground as supporters there were black guys and maybe it's because west ham had had some black football fascinating wasn't it when I, I, this is going back more than 10 years so long after 1980 but i took my wife my brazilian wife to upton park exactly for for her to see this hmm. you know because you walk out the tube station and you are in bangladesh Hmm. And then it's now, the, the, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and then during the course of the day, the white working class who have moved out, they come back and reclaim it for a, for, for a few hours. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's there's a story that a line that I remember from the eighties, you know, at Tottenham. Sometimes the devil has all the best tunes. Uh, I don't take any pride in this, but you know, West Ham are giving it the old Johnny Lyles Claret and Blue Army. Uh, and the, the obvious comeback is Johnny Lyle is a Pakistani, which is quite mm. funny, you know, it, the, 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 oh, this, this humour. I don't find it funny. I don't no, find it but, funny. There's no, such no, thing as casual, no, there's no such thing as casual racial humour, I'm sorry. It's yeah, not funny. No, you're right. You're you might right. find it you're right. funny as a white person, but I don't find it funny. 
you know, yeah, I, I, I apologize for ever having no, found no, it no, found no, it no, no, no. You have your right to find humor. That's fine. I'm not in any way getting at you. I'm just saying I don't find that funny because I suffered for some real, you know, yeah. BS. You well, know, that, that, that's why that's why I shouldn't find it funny for that same reason because no, no, you a joke. To, no, no, no because a joke has to be funny for everyone. Calling John Nada Pakistani is not funny for me, you know, because the P word was so. No, look, yes. I'm, not, I'm, in, I'm actually of Indian origin, but I've been called the yeah. P word. And I don't mind yeah. Pakistani friends and community. And some of my dad's best friends, you know, used to smoke wood, wood binds and watch the World Cup and play cards, and they were Pakistanis. But any racial co- joke to me really just uh, it gets over my head or goes underneath me. Nothing against you, honestly, I promise. But I can't well, find it. Should it should be. No, but, you're, <laughs> no, but you're, you're, you're talking from your own experience, and that's fine. If you want to join in and find that funny, I absolutely you defend your right to, because humour, you know, I mean, that's not the most offensive bit of humour. I, 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 I found it funny in a guilty sense then. Yeah. It was a, it was, it was, it was, it was a kind of guilty kind of, uh, I didn't join in. Yeah. Um, but you're right, it's wrong. Well, no, it's not wrong. It's, it's, it's not wrong. I'm not one to judge you. I promise you. I want to make apologies to you. I don't judge you. No, I just no, find no, no, any, no. Jo- any, jo- any joke that has a racial connotation, no matter how innocent it might be, it's not funny. You know. I mean, we've yeah. moved on so so much since those days. You look at goodness gracious me on TV now, and how yeah. how many years ahead that was. That's taken spun it on its head. We need to concentrate more on that kind of humour. I think. Yeah, yeah, and but the division that I was talking about, and there is. Um an old Jamaican saying, who feels it knows it. So you're always going to feel it different if you're the recipient of it directly. But like, in a way, the thing I was trying to say before was about the schism that there must have been, uh, which I, I mean, my one of my close school friends, um, the really close school friends till today is of Asian origin. And I'm not saying that we were fighting black and Asian, but when you get into a situation, I've seen this with music as well, where there was so much racism in the seventies at clubs, the bouncers wouldn't let you in because you were black or Asian, um, wouldn't let you in, just wouldn't let you in. And your white friends would apologize for going in to soul night at the Lyceum in the center of London. It was kind of like a, it was kind of a weird kind of thing going on there. But then are black West Ham supporters not guilty of a similar kind of, you know, schism between them and their Asian friends if their Asian friends are being attacked? And the black friends are amongst those who, maybe not attacking them directly, but so, certainly amongst that that mm. group of people. That's a really good point. I, I don't begrudge any person going to watch a football match, regardless of their colour or their race or their sexual orientation. Football is for everyone. It's a beautiful game. And I, I grew up loving I wanted to be a footballer. If you read Namaste Giza, you'll hear how gloriously I failed. <laughs> you know, I, I um, but I, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold, I don't see a, uh, I don't see a connection with that at all, actually. And of course, you know, black people are far more represented on the on the pitch than Asians are. You know, look at it, that, it, my, you know, but when I when I when I look at TV, I'm sorry, I do look at the crowds. You know, it's a, you know, and I see loads of black people supporting Arsenal. I don't like Arsenal, <laughs> but it warms my heart when I see black people there. You know, and I look around the London Stadium now when I go there, and it gladdens me when I see. I've seen one seat guy with a turban. Several Asian families out of sixty-two thousand people, and that's it. So there's a long, long way to go. So I wouldn't knock any black mm. person, any white person, anybody from going to watch football. It's for all of us, you know. And I know it's a very romantic view, but it's a very simple view, and, a, and, a, and I think an accurate view to have. Football is romantic, though. So let's get on to this match. It's the tenth of May, nineteen eighty. Yeah. West Ham versus Arsenal at Wembley. One hundred thousand people. At Wembley, it just beggars belief, doesn't it? And West Ham are not even in the top flight against the mighty Gooners. Oh my word! What do you remember of that day? Well, yeah, I was, how old were you, and, and were you there? I was twenty-one. Why well, I, I wasn't there was because I couldn't afford it, couldn't get a ticket, too unworldly, a little bit stupid. <laughs> I didn't have any connections. You know, I was a journalist yeah. on a local paper then, an East London paper actually. No, hang on, nineteen eighty, and I think I was joining the Tottenham Herald then. So um, the chance of getting a ticket was uh, was zilch. But I watched it on TV. 
And I saw the Willie Young phone. I don't, I don't know how Willie Young sleeps with himself to this day of robbing that poor yeah. teenager of his moment of glory. Uh, but I remember, in fact, a few years ago, I went to a West Ham reunion of the 1980 squad. Uh, because my mind, you know, I've seen so much football since the World Cups and, you know, I've seen every England game in the World Cup since 1998. So I've seen a lot of football. So the match is a bit of a blur because I watched on my mum and dad's 21-inch TV, Panasonic TV. But I remember Trevor Brookings saying a few years ago when I was there, he said, because we, we asked him about, you know, because it was it's one of our most famous goals. You know, was he falling over? Was he trying to dodge Stuart Pearce and shot? He said, no, no, I got my head on it. I meant to put it in. So that's that, I think, puts that to bed, you know. So it was a, a proper goal, but it could have been two if it wasn't for really young fouling the boy Alan. Yeah, it's always I mean, a shame, I, isn't it? It's, it's always a shame, Tim, when the... Um, the denouement of a football match comes in the 13th minute. <laughs> the denouement being the only yeah, goal. And the this, th these are words that I'm unlikely to use very often. Go but on. in a way, I feel sorry for Arsenal. Um, it, it, was, it was such a boiling hot day. It was really, really hot. I remember this well for reasons that we might get into later on. Uh, and Arsenal, they'd been in contention for everything. And that they just didn't have anything in the tank. Um, a few days later, the Wednesday after, they go and play the Cup Winners' Cup final uh, against Valencia. And they can't get a goal in that one. And that goes to penalties and they lose that on penalties. They've, they've been in contention for the league. And I just don't think they've, they've, got, they've got enough in the tank. Um, and West Ham, it, it is a surprise that this West Ham side was in the second division. Because there's there's some lovely player on Alan Devonshire was a beautiful player to watch. Still, Trevor Brooking still. obviously is 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 royalty. Alvin Martin so, went on to have a, a yeah. Alvin Martin went on to have a have a have a great career. Yeah, I remember um, the, very nearly the first Brazilian in Eng, to play in England was uh, Paulo Cesar Paulo Cesar Caju, who who played against England in 1970. And at this time, 1980, he's having chats with Fulham. He ends up not signing because 50% uh, tax, and he regrets it to this day. Uh, but while he's around, he goes to a couple of games. He goes to Arsenal and he sees Liam Brady and he can't believe it. Can't believe he's watching Gerson. He's watching the left-footed maestro. And he goes to West Ham and he sees Trevor Brooking. He said, he's just, a, just an aristocrat on the ball. You know, he was a what beautiful, beautiful player. And I, the, I'd forgotten that Stuart Pearson was there. I mean, Stuart Pearson, who three years earlier was England centre-forward, Unfortunately, with very, very injury hit, and there's not much of him after this this game with West Ham, but he 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 plays a he plays a big part in the goal. It's his shot that that Brooking um, yeah. deflects in. So no, uh, surprised yeah. to me that the, the, a team with this quality, Shaq was 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 in the second division. Yeah, I mean, uh, there was also a great goalkeeper, Phil Parks. Was it Phil Parks? Nineteen eighty. Yeah. Well, West Ham has some quality, as you said, Alvin Martin and Stuart um, Tonka, Stuart uh, Ray Stuart. You know, there's some really, really good, tough players. You know, um, it was after the Bobby Moore era, of course, they were rebuilding. Um, having won the 1975 Cup, then we had a few stagnant years of to and fro And then, you know, they, they were they were they were a top side. They got out. out I think we went to I went to the League Cup final. We we lost to Liverpool. Um, um, so you know, we were quite. There weren't a no Premiership because we were a first division team apart from in name. Um, so you know, we gave Arsenal a good game that day. Closed them down and. Um, you know, as you said, it was very hot. I remember the, the, the yellow shirts glistened in the heat. And, uh, you know, I remember Stuart Pearce puffing for air. You know, <laughs> it was a tough day, but we, we took them on and we beat them 1-0 at second division side, beating first division side. So um, that was yeah, our last you, 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 uh, you heard Tim there feeling sorry for Arsenal because it was hot. You don't feel sorry for them because it was hot, do you? No way at all. No, no. No, they were the big exactly. shots. What, you know, they had, who didn't have a problem with it? Um, uh, Stapleton, I think Stapleton was uh, in England. Frank England, Stapleton uh, was there. Uh, uh, um, didn't they have in defence? It's their defence, I remember. So well, O'Leary and Willie Young. Willie Young. Pat Jennings yeah. is in goal. Pat Jennings. Uh, and it's strange to see Pat Jennings in an Arsenal goal. Yeah, but he stayed there a long time after Tottenham shut in the door. He's, he's, he's there for, for, ne for nearly, yeah. nearly a decade. It's a yeah. solid side. Pat yeah. Rice was yeah. back, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Arsenal had... The better team. So whatever the sort of circumstances of the day, I think it, it evens it up. But they didn't, it, it wasn't a brilliant match maybe. In parts, it was kind of like dreary, I would say. And possibly the the heat took it out on both sides well, as West well. West Ham this, tactically were very good. Uh, 
Very what, good. What and about- Pearson, Pearson came back into midfield. So they would, they were just they made themselves very hard to to pass through, and they could keep the ball as well. You know, that's that's the, the thing that I always loved about West Ham. That that. Mm. But, but what about that that one of the great um, FA Cup final Wembley goals ever that never was? Just take us through that. I mean, I think you've got to describe it to be honest, because it will bring tears to people's eyes to know that we as football fans were robbed of what would still stick in people's memories, you know, in the way that Jeff Hurst goal for England in the 1966 World Cup final, final goal, the second goal, uh, sticks in people's minds. You're talking about the Allen goal, the Allen goal that never was. Of course. Was, yeah, no, that's okay. Yeah, so I can't remember who put him through, but it was, um, he was on the 18 yard area on the circle and he was going past a couple of defenders going past Willie Young and Willie Young skied him down from behind and got up and didn't even look at the referee. He knew it was a yellow card and that's all it yeah. was. Nothing came with a free kick. And Alan... Last did... man as well. Sorry, mate. Yeah, but I mean... I'm sorry, really I apologise for interrupting. That's okay. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I haven't seen the video back today. So, but in my memory, he, he would have put it past, he would have slid it past Pat Jennings or dip, dinked it over him. Maybe dinking wasn't a thing of the 80s, I don't know, but he would have, he would have put it in the net and it would have been such a wonderful platform for the kid to go on and, and always remember that he scored a goal in the FA Cup final at the old Wembley, the, 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 real, the real Wembley, not the one, not yeah, the new the Wembley. Wembley. It would have been amazing, yeah. It would have been incredible. So you, I felt for him because I was roughly you know, a few years older than him. And it was my dream to score for West Ham in injury time for, for at the FA Cup final and be carried around the stadium on my teammates' shoulders. <laughs> you can both laugh, but I mean, every boy has to dream, you know. And I, and I felt for it, 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 it stayed with me that day and it stayed with me for a long time, you know. I mean, I, I really felt for him. It was Carl Amcar, sorry. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, um, I, uh, I, 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 as I said, I don't know how Willie Young slept with himself that night or maybe, just, I don't know now what he, what he thinks of it. I don't, know, I don't know what he said about it. Has anybody read anything about him in the past? No, 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 no. no. I just know no. from it. Nick, Nick Hornby writing that it was it was the most Arsenal thing imaginable. You know, the really? Arsenal of, 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 of that time, you know. Yeah. Who, yeah. Were your, who were your favourites in the team? Who did you, who did you most okay. idolise or Devin, relate with? Alan Devonshire, for me, was so deft with his foot and left foot going down the wing and you know, just dancing past players and, uh, you know, they'd be still standing still and he'd be gone, you know. And, of course, he made the goal, didn't he, you know. And, and uh, so he was one of my favourites of the team. Alvin Martin, of course, right at the centre of defence. Very tough. Tonka, Stewart, you know, with the way, never missed a penalty, always broke the net, you know. Um, it was, you know, they're all, they're, all, they're all like a family. You know, they, they work for each other. And I think the manager made them feel like they were each of them were the best players in the world. At that time... They were together, a, a fantastic unit. I mean, I, I, sorry, I don't know who we pl- beat in the semi-final. Um, was it Chelsea? I can't remember. Stamford Bridge, wasn't it? I mean, we just had great players and a great team. So, you know. Oh, oh, we've seen the photographs, the images of the celebrations afterwards. West Ham winning the FA Cup final. You know that those uh, narrow streets of uh, the East End, East Ham or West Ham are going to be filled with people. And so it was. It feel, <laughs> feels like uh, all the 100,000 from Wembley were there on the streets that day. So um, probably including Arsenal fans, who knows, uh, dressed in claret and blue, of course. But where were you then? Because you've already intimated that it, you weren't, it wasn't a comfortable landscape for you. Lots and lots and lots and lots of pictures of West Ham fans all white, but a few black fans as well celebrating. Where were you? I was there. I was I was there for the seventy five parade as well as the eighty parade. Very much again on my own. No no friends to you know people of colour to ring up and say. Um, of course, there were no cell phones in those days, so you couldn't actually coordinate with people. There, there must have been friends from school there because uh, my school, you know, were my mates were West Ham, Arsenal, and Tottenham. But on that day, I was by myself down at East Ham Town Hall, down Green Street. Um, you only get a fleeting glimpse of the bus going past, but it's something that you'll always remember. You know. Um, do you do you miss um, the old bowling ground? I do. Yeah, I, I, I was um, a season ticket holder in the East End for many years, um, so you can almost breathe down the players' necks. You know, when we left Upton Park, I was uh, based in New York for the Mail. I was an American correspondent, so I don't take any blame. You know, I, I 
I watched the last match against Manchester. <laughs> See, I watched the, I mean, it was like Brexit. I, I, I wasn't involved in Brexit either. It's not my fault either. You know? uh, it all happened well up behind my back. You know, I come back and we're, we're, we're screwed. Well, he said the C word, so we're screwed. You know? <laughs> so, no, I, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think you'll end up cutting out the C word, and he, he probably, oh, yeah, probably yeah. should. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we were, I, I don't. I don't. I don't feel home at London Stadium at all. Um, but did you, did you did you feel because th- there's there's a melancholy there? So the the old bowling ground, Upton Park, is it bittersweet memories? Oh, God, really good question. Really good question. Um, it's more sweetness than bitter. There are bitter memories. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had that story to tell to write in my book. Mm. Um, but, you know, I'm a Cockney guy. You know, I'm from East London. I'm get up and go. And uh, I am a cup half full. I've always been, I've always lived my life like that. I'm very optimistic. I think I'm very lucky to have had the experiences that I've had. I'm certainly very lucky to have seen some great goals at West Ham. seen Trevor Brooking play and Bobby Moore, Clyde Best, Addie Coker. You know, some of my heroes. You know, I just, you know, when you're a schoolboy, you get caught up in this, this kind of uh, romantic charm of this free-flowing football. It's so wonderful. I mean, it really, yeah, I mean, they are bitter because I used to see the Skinners and I saw some Skinners with knives having to go at the police and, uh, you know, and I'd be called the Stani and, you know. And also National Front used to sell Bulldog outside the stadium. And you know. at the stadium, I remember that. I remember that very clearly, actually, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of my friends told me they sold them inside the stadium, but I don't have any evidence of that. But they sold them out. I should see them. I used to walk past them. They would snarl at me and... Uh, you know, and, but I knew I was fine because I'm a, I'm a cocky git, you know, from the East End. You know, I I know there are police around. I know I can run. I know there are good people who look after me. You know, I've got to be positive about my life. Otherwise, if I get negative, I'm going to waste my life. You know? So I live it very much um, on a positive foot. I, so, I, I find this astonishingly brave because... Thank you, but... And I think this this, this is an experience that everyone should have. I, I was... This is going back about 15 years. I was in Peru and I was at a game... Uh, Alianza Lima. Alianza Lima is the team of the people. And yeah. it was a local derby. And I turn up. And most places in South America, I can kind of blend in. I look of European extraction and therefore rich, but I could be a local. Hmm. Not there. Not there. Not in Peru. Hmm. They're all little. You no, know, it's quite quite small people of indigenous stock. You know, this, team, this is the, the, the team of, of, of the working class. And going around looking for the press entrance, the number of people who are trying to pick fights with me, who, you know, like pushing me or trying to trip me up as I go, as I go past. Uh, and I thought, you know, I'm getting too old for this, but I, I remember thinking, cause it, it, it's one thing to understand. It's another thing to overstand. And at that moment I was overstanding what it's like to be that conspicuous and to be that in territory that people don't think is yours. And, the idea of going through that experience for pleasure on a regular basis, I think that's that, that's astonishingly brave. Mm. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I mean, I, I um, there wasn't much else, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, the school and the scouts. I used to get bullied at scouts. Honestly, I'm not a victim, but I had a pretty tough time as a quite a lonely kid. You know, um, didn't get girlfriends until very late. You know, and had a, a, and I switched schools between thirteen and. Yeah, obviously, I haven't read the book, right? You haven't seen it yet. Because no, the story's yeah, in the I'd book. like to. Yeah, no, thank you. But my father switched, maybe switched schools because he just thought I'd get better. My brother went to the other school. So I went to McKenzie in Walthamstow. Now, I still carried my dreams of being a footballer. So I was still very much, I used to have Leighton Orient uh, and bunking over the wall and, uh, you know, watch them play. And, uh, you know, and I, I dreamt of, I didn't want to do anything else but be a footballer. I wanted to play for West Ham, as you said be carried around Wembley on my teammates' shoulders, holding the FA Cup, having scored the last, <laughs> like, like Paul Allen, he scored the, cup the last minute, which the Paul Allen never got to do. Um, but in my school, um, you know, my football dreams were killed because the players like Tre- Terry Herlock was in my team, school team, you know, who went on to be a Rangers legend. Mm. Uh, Steve Neville played for Exeter. The quality was so high. I could only make the B team and... Uh, you know, I was soon you found couldn't out. mention Millwall there when he when he talks back to you. Like, did you? you couldn't do it. You went I somewhere else. Give myself to it. I need a glass of water. <laughs> yeah, Millwall legend as well. He's still a mate of mine actually. We're still mates, so uh, we don't talk about Millwall. He's a lovely lad, Terry. Really love. I know he's a very hard man on football, 
but he was great at school. And um, so my dreams of football died. So, but I still, I live my life vicariously through them and through the West Ham players and Leighton Orient, actually, who are my second team. Yeah, there, there is a question about why there aren't top flight Asian footballers, British Asian footballers in our leagues. Um, there is a question mark. I know there is because we all played football at school. Some of the best players were the Asian kids. I played five yeah, sides in. Still today, still today, uh, some of the best players in a five-a-side down the road from me are the Asian kids. So what what has gone wrong? Uh, I wonder if part of the narrative and these things take a generation and perhaps more to sort themselves out, but part of that narrative that we've been talking about, that um, we were in hostile environments, not entirely, but generally, if you talk about football landscape, um, you know, I can tell you that Tottenham weren't coming recruiting where I lived, which was just down the road from White Hart Lane. Otherwise, a few of the footballers that I knew might have got through and, and their lives have been very different. So what, what has happened with the Asian community? Why, why aren't we seeing top flight Asian footballers well, from this country? In our okay. So what, what happened, what's happening to answer your question? And I'll go into it. I'll use one we East End word, nothing. Right. Because, uh, I mean, even like my, my mate is the head of Kick It Out, uh, Sunil Bandari. I've known him for 30, 35 years. And I talked to him uh, as I was writing this book. And really, he couldn't put his finger on it. I mean, there's all the reasons that we got, we know about that the stereotypes about Asians, you know, certain physique and, and mentality and capability um, that parents don't want us to put. I talked to John Terry's mum, Sue Terry, and I, I was talking to her about what, how she got, she's got two sons, John and Paul. Both were footballers. Paul played for Leighton Orient and Yeovil. And Sue Terry put, hit it on the head without actually realising she was giving me some very valuable information. She said, you know, when the boys were young, schoolboys, uh, in, in here, in East End, she, they would come home at school at 3.30. They'd have their tea, as they'd call it, um, and go off and play a football match. Come back at 5 o'clock. She'd wash their kids while they had something to eat properly. And then they'd go play another match or train. This was nightly, each night, every week night after night, Sundays or matches. And I thought then, I thought, you know, that's where, perhaps where, I mean, I've got a daughter. If I had a son, that's probably where I'd go wrong because I wouldn't have that dedication. I think maybe the uh, footballers who are getting there have been supported by their parents, you know. I was in Manchester doing a story recently and I bumped into a, um, a West Indian couple in the Hilton there, in Deansgate and they were going up the lift with me and I started, chat, started chatting to them. It was a 16-year-old kid, black kid. And he was with his mother and he'd been to Man City and they'd brought him over, put him in the Hilton and his parents had come and, you know, were mentoring him and nurturing him. And I think that's probably one of the reasons because, I mean, it's, it sounds so textbook stereotypical to say that we prefer to go into doc, to medicines or law, you know, or business. It's true. But there has to be a way for Asians to get into football in the premiership. And as Sunil couldn't even really put his finger on it, I don't think I'm qualified I don't get it either, you know, but some of those reasons are about having the right mentality, having the right sponsorship from your parents, from teachers, from uh, from your friends, you know, and being part of it. And I think football has been very divisive. I think, it, for, as you said, we've talked about, there were no very few Asian faces on the terraces. My God, I used to be so happy when Sir Alex Ferguson was in charge of Manchester United. And there were a group of, you're laughing, like, good, smiling, there were, good, there were a group of Sikh people behind him. And there were women, mm. there were Asian women there. I don't see any Asian women in football. You know, maybe I'm blind. I don't know. So there is a lot to be done, a lot of work to be done. We're nowhere near getting any. Luton Town. Yeah, there are leagues in Birmingham. Town. Luton Town Town have done a lot to try and bring the local community, which is, you know, it's a large percentage Asian, into the grounds. And they are making inroads with. Uh, Asian women coming to the football matches as well. They are making inroads, but I think, like you say, you you have to make the effort because when you've been uh, disassociated from that experience for years and years and years, it's going to take something to bring you into those stadiums. I wonder, if I might just ask this, I know you've got a question, Tim, bear with me. Um, I wonder if, I mentioned it earlier on because we're not quite of the same generation. No, we are. One, two, three. Are. Yeah, are. yeah, we're exactly the same generation. So when I was 12 years old, I remember very distinctly these 
books that were being passed around uh, at school hand to hand. It was a book called Skinhead, Skinhead right. by Rick, Richard Allen, who um, I found out about much later. He was a pretty much um, unsober Scottish guy that worked for a publishing company called New English Library, and he decided to knock out these throw away I mean they're dreadful to read in any case but they came around the schools and we never ever I mean seeing a kid uh, called Joe Hawkins on the cover and he was a West Ham supporter etc 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 but pretty quickly into the book he's um, assaulting uh, an Asian family or whatever and I remember reading that in that book I mean quite a, a grave assault to say the least I remember reading that book and it was an uncomfortable kind of moment. It, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand why it was happening. Um, my Asian friends read the book and none of them felt, you know, happy about that at all because what happened as a result of that is that just the same way as we had the impression that West Ham fans were all skinheads because Joe Hawkins was, the same way you had an impression that Asian people were being attacked all over the place and they'd never experienced it before. I'd never experienced this either. Do you remember those books and did they have any impact? No, I'm sorry, I don't, didn't read any of those books. Probably no one had given them to me or they didn't come my way. When, how old were you then? You were 12 or 13. 12. I was 12 and I'm exactly the same age as you. Um, yeah. Well, they're, they're all over the place. It, it was a series of books afterwards. They just became like kind of silly but it was the first books we'd ever seen swear words in and I think that was the first thing that attracted me my brother gave me a sort of a copy with all sellotape because it'd been passed around all the schools etc or everybody at schools but I'd never seen anything with swear words in it before quite apart mm. from any story about in it anyway let's put that to one side because no, no, it's, it's I do like feel uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't read those I, I books. Culturally, culturally, it did something, particularly to my Asian friends, that yeah. um, they weren't, they were discombobulated by that, if I can put it mildly. Anyway. Yeah. See, I couldn't take any more than I was already seeing in my own eyes. And you must remember that, you know, Tim would probably remember as well, in the early 70s, it was a time of Ralph Garnet, you know, who was the biggest MF going, you know, and um, wore West Ham scarf, claret and blue. So there was enough um, published material for me to know that West how West Ham were being seen, and this this encouraged the idiots to come out, you know. So th those skinheads they used to call me uh, Enoch, you know, when because of Enoch Powell, you know. And if I walked down the street, I'd be called Curry Munch. And this is all coming from, you know, uh, love thy neighbour. Because you know? Johnny Spate invented that character yeah. as a condemnation. You know, this is an East yeah. Ender himself. This this is yeah. rub. It, it, it's like rubbing the 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 nose of his own people in their own excrements. That's yeah. what he's trying to do. But yeah. do you think the Afghanic character was counterproductive? Absolutely, I think people laughed with him, not at him. In, the, in they laughed with him. You know, so, oh yeah, he's brilliant. That's, the, that's how we see them. That's what they do. Those C W O N S. You know, those words. You know, yeah. um, you know. I mean. I, it would never, wouldn't happen now, of course. You know, if any if anybody thought they could get on Channel Four or BBC and use those kind of phrases, but mm. we, I mean, I talked to Bill Gardner, who was the head of uh, ICF, uh, and you know, he he was West Ham's most notorious hooligan, and uh, he came to my book launch, uh, and sorry, Nolsey as well, who um, was the hero of Alkmaar, and I asked Bill. I actually met Bill in New York, and you know, he's the first chance I had to ask these guys who'd made my life a misery, the very vision of them. What the, was going on and he said and he just came out very simply he said look i never hit any west ham fan i never hit anybody because of the skin the color of his skin i did think well maybe there was so few of them around but then he said and, and them he used the word them them were different times you know and i think we are evolving you can't tamper with history you know we can't say that it never happened it did happen i mean bill's now nearly 70 you know, and, and, a, and a kind old gentleman but he's been through a lot with West Ham. He's probably seen a lot that went on. And I believe him. I, I, I don't need to forgive him or forget what he's done. He's, 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 he's squared it with me. Um, so, But what, reading a book about Skinners would not have done me any good at all. It would just probably scared the... Uh, scared. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was pornography, really, those books. Because I, I remember them. I mean, cause yeah. was, I'm, what, six years younger than you. And I remember yeah. them being prized items. 
Yeah, uh, and it's, 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 it's just violent them, pornography, I think. What, what do you think of them at the time? Were you, were you, um, you know, did you feel disgusted well, by them? Or, uh, sorry, well, Tim, I was yeah, asking. totally, totally. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I had, in this sense, I had uh, a very good anti-racist education, and I'm mm. from, I'm from, I'm from Hemel Hempstead, right? Which a lot of West Ham fans there actually, because although it's northwest, a lot yeah. of the people who came out came out from from northeast northeast London. Uh, mm. And it was an area in the seventies where the National Front were looking to to, to recruit. Mm. I grew up in a in council flats, and there we we had um, we had Asian neighbours, Pakistani neighbours, uh, and they kind of chose us as the people who were, who, who were being nice to them. So every yeah. religious festival, you know, they would bring us food and stuff. You know, it was lovely. Yeah. Um, but my old man was really into sport, and his mm. life was football and cricket. And through cricket, he had total respect for uh, West Indians, Indians and Pakistanis because he yeah, knew yeah. them through cricket, you know. Yeah. So yeah. In, uh, in, in that sense, and he would, he would drill into me. In fact, some of the, the, he, he died about 15 years ago and some of my last conversations with him were getting a bit painful because he was, he was watching too much, too much uh, TV news and I could feel he was... It was edging towards the dark side, um, but yeah. for for all of my youth, it was always there as English as you and I, and yeah. never forget it, and have yeah. respect, because yeah. these people had won his respect on the on the cricket field. So um, yeah. yeah, so I was going to say it's so easy for someone like me to forget that there are decent people like your father, there are, there are like you, there are good people in this world, and there are good people on the terraces. In my book, I say, you know that. I used to stand next to people I felt safe with, white people, of course, with West Ham scarves. But I knew that, and they'd lift me up and put me on the uh, safety barriers. You know, I wasn't a kid. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, I mean, so, you know, I, I, and they, they, were, they weren't 100% racist or thugs or skinheads or, you know, there were a lot of good people. And as a kid, you remember that. You know, I mean, little things in football stay with me that make me realise that football is a game for everyone. I know it sounds very romantic, but when I was a kid, I asked this geezer for his autograph. I, you know, and he was talking to some guys in Max, and um, he wrote down his signature, and he gave back to me. And I looked up at him, you know, and looked at it. And I thought, oh, I don't know who you are. And he wrote down. He took it back and smiled and wrote down John Toshak. Right now, for me, that was a great moment because as I grew up, I realised he became a Real Madrid star, <laughs> Liverpool star, the Welsh. <laughs> you know, he's a legend. But for that moment of humility, and by the way, that was a turning point for my life as well because. I wondered what those guys, who those guys were, and they turned out to be reporters. And from that day onwards, I thought, so they go to see football, they get the best seats, they get paid for it, and they talk to the, that's the football way. players. So honestly, way. it's real, in my book. It's, that's it's why, that, yeah. that is uh, how and why I became a music journalist. I couldn't, you know, I was paying to go to gigs, and I thought, yeah. stuff that. But do you know what you said about Bulldog? Uh, yeah. magazine which was this national front magazine i remember it so distinctly and it wasn't just outside west ham to be fair and it was down on our high street and there wasn't much you could do about it you know look yeah. you in the face and sell them out. what could you do what you're going to start a ruck or what but what i remember that was positive because there was always a balance you asked him what he thought of those books like i say i, I genuinely i was like any racism that you read about for the first time, it does affect you as well. Um, and But because there was this kind of like um, teenage swagger, for want of a better way of describing it, rebelliousness about the book, it somehow uh, transgressed that. Because like I said, my Asian friends, they were totally horrified by those passages but they read the books and we all kind of knew that it was important these books were important the books were reflecting what a lot of people go through um in a way that the standard books weren't like you know bill what's his name of the inner intercity firm said i said bill sorry bill gardner bill was it Bill, Bill Gardner. Gardner, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Bill Gardner. The, them were different, different times, yeah. and and 
the, the the thing that saved me when I went to Upton Park several times actually. Clyde Best, remember seeing him. Addie Coker, who I never actually saw play, was a complete inspiration to me because he was Nigerian. And the one thing that I remember the most that made it safe, you see, people forget small moments in football, like when Bobby Moore swapped shirts with Pele in that 1970 World Thank Cup. Yeah. Do you know what that meant? I mean, even where I was in North London, it 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 made life easier that the England captain was embracing this black guy. You know, when you said earlier, Brazil was your international team. It was all our international teams, as yeah, you well course, know, yeah, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all our international, because otherwise, yeah. it, because we couldn't find a home in the England team, yeah. particularly during those days of yeah, racism. You, you, you mentioned that you, you watched the game with your parents. Hmm. What did they make of it? And what did, what did they make of your level of interest in this thing? Oh, I think my, my, my father was a West Ham fan in terms of it take me because he wanted his son to be happy. So he was he was um mesmerized mesmerized by my jumping around, you know, the, the room. My mum was more busy coming out of the kitchen giving us food and, and and you know, she would marvel at the way footballers jumped around crying and or celebrating, you know, and saying but doba doba, which means wow, wow, look at that, you look at how mad they are, you know. My first rep my first ever Memory of football is in 1963. I was four years old when Bobby Charlton scored against Leicester City, and I was, we were watching on a black and white TV. And I remember, I'm, I'm, I remember it just there. My mum going, "What the hell is going on here? Look at him! He's gone mad! He's jumping around!" And he's only, you know, she didn't understand football, so she was always. Um, my parents were always uh, on the periphery, not quite getting it, but enjoying the moment, seeing their son really into it. You know, I hope we can talk about England, by the way, because I really got some. Interesting stuff to tell Go you. On. If you Go on. Yeah. No, so no need to tell us that West Ham won the World Cup. We know. Ah, yeah. Well, you remember that. Okay. <laughs> it's good that we got that out of the way in one sentence, you know, so we can carry on because I know we're running out of time. Um, so uh, in my book, Namaste Giza, right, so I've written a chapter about England. Um, and I don't want to give too much away, but it's about why I can never sport. I, I still cannot sport England to this day despite having seen every England match in every World Cup since 98, I still can't support them. And it's got a lot to do with uh, the time I've, I've been you know, brought up in the, in the 70s with the, the skinheads, the fascists, the racists. And when you see, when I go to England matches, I, oh, it's, it's lesser now. See, the team are great, you know, with Bukayo Saka and Rashford yeah. and, um, you know, um, the, the team it does represent me. But I'm mm. afraid... What goes around the England team doesn't represent me. Because when yeah. I hear the word, you know, when I hear the England anthem, it doesn't happen so much now, but I still hear it, 10 German Bombers, which is the most awful song celebrating death of soldiers in a war. You know, I hear it at football matches. I've heard it on foreign shores. I've heard it been, I've heard it been sung to by, sung to bemused German fans. When I hear that, when I hear IRA scum in the national anthem, why do they play the, the Great Escape, the official FA band, which is a tune from a war film? Why do they play that? So all these things, I hear these songs and I hear, you know, uh, see, uh, it's very complicated to explain so quickly, but, you know, I don't didn't know much about the British Empire, the imperialism, the colonialism, until I read some books about it myself. I wasn't taught it at school. So as I grew up into a man, got married, had children, I became more and more, as I said, you can't tamper with history, but you mustn't deny people his history. In our schools, we're not taught about what Britain did to so much of the world and then turn it into the empire and then the commonwealth. Um, and we still live on that. And every, every time I hear those racist songs, I hear the echo of the bullets in Amritsar, in, 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 in the Punjab. I, when I, I, people I, I, I do totally understand that. I too, Me too. hundred percent understand yeah. that. But the one thing I would say, as my wife said to me, when England, um, uh, the England team stood in line against Brazil, in the uh, the World Cup in Japan and South Korea, I think it was. Yeah, 2002. And, right, and so my 
daughters would have been, one would have been four years old and the other would have been two years old at the time. And when my daughter, my older daughter asked me, who am I supporting? Because remember the match was early in the morning for us. It was like... Mm. Oh, was there. I was there. Yeah. Like that, it was early, know, in the, early in the morning yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. even yeah. earlier in the morning <laughs> for you in Brazil. But um, and my wife asked me, you know, my daughter asked me, who are you supporting? And I said, Brazil, of course. And my wife looked at me and she was horrified and she said, look, look at that England team. Half of them are black, mixed heritage, whatever you want to say. That's her generation. That's your children's generation there. And if we're to, there's nothing we can do about the past, like you said, and let's not, you know, pretend it didn't happen. But as our, certainly my children, I was born in Africa, my children were born over here. What legacy am I supposed to leave them if I can't um, show them how to love the England team and how to embrace the England team and how to be part of it? Because those kids are going out representing my children. Mm. And that was the moment, that was the moment in 2002 that I became mm. an England fan. It was also, you, if, if you learn a little bit more about the history of, of Brazil, you realise it's, it's, it's hard to find a place there as well. You know, well, yeah, this very, Thank very you. romanticized image from from afar yeah. of a country yeah. that didn't abolish slavery. In no, we, we just saw black players. We just saw yeah. black yeah. players, and you know, yeah. for us, Pele, the greatest player in the world, was black. That was amazing. It was enough, you know. Yeah. But it's more so, complex I mean, than that. Look, we're running out of time. Most of my education came from music, hmm. uh, and music of of this time. It's I'm I'm just short of being fifteen when the, the, this the first the first time I ever got drunk at this day. Uh, I bought a big bottle of, of beer. Uh, I thought, I'm, Jack, lad, I'm yeah. nearly 15, you know, and uh, it's lager. Uh, and I had a long, long walk home. I watched it around a mate's house who were, who were Arsenal fans. And no one was drinking, so it was just me drinking. And I had this long walk home on this boiling hot day. Uh, and uh, so I'm walking along, so no one's drunk it. So it's, it's still, so I'm walking along, swigging it. I remember someone stopped me and asked for a, and they drank it, and they said, "No, no, no, no. You want to, you want to, you want to throw the beer away and drink the bottle. That's how that's how foul this stuff was." But as I'm going, I'm getting more and more, and I arrive back home and I just throw up all over the place. Um, so uh, it's the first time I got drunk. But th- my education, it came not from school. It came from music, and th- th- there's a song. It's an album song. A few months earlier than this, it's uh, "Little Boy Soldiers" by by the by the Jam of the Setting Suns album. And it's mm-hmm. such a fabulous song about being working class in an imperial country, yeah. about how how that lever is used by those in command, but how you're also dying thousands of miles away from home for, for a cause that is not yours. And that, that, was, that was such an education. And I think stuff like that should be on the national curriculum. And if it was... That, and if it had been back in 1979 when that song came out, um, then maybe you would have suffered a little bit less on the terraces of Upton Park and in and, and, and in, in, your, in your general life. Yeah, I think I think it's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, I think music protected me as well in many ways because I'm a reggae nut. Good, you know. I grew up, I grew oh up wow! With, <laughs> yeah, I grew up with Indian boys who introduced me to you know I've seen all the reggae greats, Yellow Man and uh, Gregory Isaacs and Dennis Brown. So I grew up, and so I had lots of black mates, and it was a diversion for me. So I think music can form part of your culture. But can I just say, you made a point about the past. Um, we can learn from the past. You know, we can't tell, but we can learn from the past. And when you talk about your um, your image with your daughters of the England team lining up in 2002, I think it might have been Sapporo. I, can't, I was there, I can't remember. I do have to say that when we lost the when England lost the final in Wembley against Italy, who got the abuse? The three black yeah. players, Sancho. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly they haven't gone away. Except, not gone away. No, no. no. We, it, we have, it to has actual, a, have to know about that. From, from from afar, it seems to me to be getting worse, as right wing politics has nothing to offer post two thousand and eight. Yeah. Let's find a villain. Let's mobilise yeah. against the villain. So yeah, my yeah. view from afar is this: this again, battles that I thought had been won definitively haven't been. Yeah. No, I don't think. Uh, I, like, I don't. I don't think my life. Sorry, if you talk and in your life, if you're the same age as me, I think you're. No, that's all right. Tim's younger. So I don't think it's going to be obliterated. Uh, something, 
I mean, I've, I've again, I'm sorry to talk about my book, but in my book, I say that we really need to root out these races. Clubs need to be dot points, just like the financial uh, fair play rules. Point. I know it will affect the fans and the good team, the good players. I mean, when Harry Kane takes the knee, Black Lives Matters. Black lives matter, and they matter a lot less. They need to matter a lot more. So does every life. I mean, so we need to keep going. We need to, we need to, I'm sorry, but we need to have tougher regulations. We can't keep skipping over and saying, oh, what a great side it is. We've got six black players, we've got a black goalkeeper, Manchester United. No, no, it's not good enough. We need more action. We need more rules. And I'm sorry, it needs to be a difficult period before we can come out of it. Yeah, and I, I don't disagree with that. Um, you're, you're more radical and militant about this than I am. But I will say this, to see footballers taking the knee, many of them understanding what they were doing. I remember hearing Ben Mee about how upset he was as Burnley captain when those mm -hmm. Burnley supporters hired a, um aircraft to wave a banner saying white lives matter too. And I totally saw how he understood Black Lives Matter. And I have a lot of respect for him, not just him, several other footballers, but that remains in my mind distinctively. Then he went to Brentford. Mm. And Brentford has, you know, a, a, a number of black players there. I am 100% sure that that experience in Burnley um, has strengthened Ben Mee in playing with the players around him. Um, yeah. Because you, these things have a lasting impact. I, mm. I don't know. I don't think you end these things definitively. But I will say, as we're talking about music and we're running out of time, Gino's number one on this week that we're talking about. What an education that was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go on, you tell us then. Um, you, you love your music. I know it's not Reggie and there's no Reggie in the charts this time around. But uh, Gino, Dexy's Midnight Runners. Do you remember hearing that? Me or Tim? Yeah, at the time. Sorry, yeah, no, you. At so, the time. so me or Tim? Sorry, who are you asking? No, for you, for you. Oh, me, yeah, of course I know. Yeah, I mean, I love the way that it was like an, it was like an industrial construction site. They walked on, picked up their instruments. Yeah, you know, they were all they start blowing around. I just loved it. It was an amazing piece of music. Uh, um, I mean, that, we're just coming out of the seventies, weren't we? The disco um, time and. Were the punk rockers around? I think the punk rockers were over as well. So it was a new phase. Yeah. And I, thought, I just thought it was, yeah, an incredible song. And I think it stayed at number one for 25 years. You know, it, was there, it was there a long time. It's, it's, it's a homage to the importance of black music in, in, in the English musical tradition. You know, and it, it, it's an it was an education for that, as well as being yeah. just beautifully written. The lowest head yeah. in the crowd that night, just polishing steps and keeping out of the fights. What a, what, what a fantastic <laughs> summing Good up line. of of that experience watching Gino yeah. Washington in 68 before before Jimmy's machine and the rock steady rub at number 4 call me uh, by well actually we should perhaps mention at number 3 coming up by yeah, Paul McCartney three, because and as yeah. as Shaq mentioned there's lots of kind of disco and lots of kind of jazz funk. It's 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 the it's the sound of there's lots of it. And this is Macca having a go at it. And Macca, I remember as a 14 year old kid buying Smash Hits, which at the time was was it was my first exposure to to quality writing. And there was an interview with with Macca, and he's asked, "What do you like?" And he said, "Yeah, I really like the two tone stuff, and I really like uh, stuff that's coming out of Black in America. It's always the 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 the, the blacks who, who are doing the best music." And yeah, spot on. And this is this is Macca having a go at, having a go at kind of disco records. Yeah, yeah, great beat on it. Wasn't it the video where he played Buddy Holly in it? Is that, is that right? Where he dressed up as Buddy Holly? He, he dressed up as everyone, including yeah, um, including the fella out of Sparks with the moustache. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 It was brilliant. I'm not sure it, it's I Buddy mean, Holly or um, or Hank Marvin out the show. It might, it might be Hank Marvin. Buddy Holly was in there. Yeah, no, I, I think, think they were Buddy Holly. Buddy Holly. I think yeah. it's Buddy Holly because uh, well, Mecca was a big fan of Buddy Holly. Yeah, and in fact, Buddy. about this time, yeah, about this time, he produced the musical Buddy Holly, the uh, the theatre musical about Buddy Holly. Okay, at number four, Blondie. Um, uh, will you all say hi to that? Yeah, brilliant track. Yeah, I was yeah. Fan of Blondie. Always fancy Debbie Harry. Uh, the very sexy way she's recording <laughs> now. So, get to the back of the rap, you. you know, they went on to make Rapture, which is one of my one of my favourite songs. Actually, you know, the beat is incredible. At number ten, at number ten, my perfect cousin by the Undertones. 
It's fantastic. There was so much it's good brilliant. stuff coming along, coming along yeah. in that, that, that post-punk thing. It was going off in so many different directions. Uh, mm. Another one full of great lines. And there's one specifically aimed at you. He thinks that I'm a cabbage because I hit University Challenge. That's the only one here who's been on University Challenge. That one's aimed <laughs> right at you. Thank you. And then at number 13, I said there was no Reggie, but this kind of amalgamation. It's their first, their first yeah, it was their very, And it was a 12-inch as well, as I, as I remember. Um, out of nowhere, UB40, this new kind of reggae sound out of Birmingham, um, all on YTS schemes, as at least they said they were at the time, at two brothers who have now gone their very separate ways. But it's a great track, isn't it, about Martin Luther King. King um, slash Food for Thought, double A side yeah. by UB. I prefer Ford. Food for Thought of the two, but I, I like them both. Mm. But I think yeah, Food for Thought. Just, yeah. I remember being, being just... at a Birmingham game not long back, and the fans mm. were going, duh, 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 duh. Da, 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 da. And I think, what's that? It's, it's food for thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you hear yeah. this stuff coming out of speakers with the bass, I mean, yeah. it could be a, a, could be from Trenchtown or Montego Bay. They're so good, UB40. They were so good. Uh, well, yeah, they're two UB40s now, controversially. Mm -hmm. And um, the brothers, Robin Campbell and Ali Campbell, don't see eye to eye, very much hostile towards you. I caught them on YouTube uh, very recently. First of all, I saw... Uh, Robin Campbell being interviewed by this very nice German interviewer and said, so what's happened between you and your brother? You know, why are there two UB40s now? Um, because the other UB40, the rest of the group without Ali, they can go under the moniker of UB40 without explanation, whereas Ali's got to go under the qualification of UB40 featuring Ali Campbell. Those are the rules. Those are the rules. Which means they, that in they the came kind, kind, kind of along in, in the, the toe end of, of, of the two tone thing, you know, they're not part of two tone, yeah. but it, it's a no, similar no, no. and from the same in, area, from the Midlands. Yeah. And in this chart, we got the selector, yeah, and the special. Words, I mean, Ghost Town, is, Ghost, Ghost Town is a subliminal political record. I mean, it was at the time when Thatcher was ruining the country, and and uh, that, that song just summed it up. I mean, they're, they're incredibly talented bands we had then. Why must the youth fight against themselves? Exactly. Another one who, who is yeah. kind of linked, I think, is is although they're coming from a different place, the Ruts. Well, I think we're just a magnificent yeah. band. They're they're in the charts with staring at the Rude Boys, and it's one of those things you wonder what would have happened to the what would have happened if Malcolm Owen hadn't topped himself. What would they have gone on to do? Because I think they were they were they were fantastic. Jar Wars is 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 is, is an epic white band take on on on, on reggae music. Reggae, yeah, yeah. Uh, Talk of the town, the Pretenders at number twenty two. Before that, though, working my way back to you by the Detroit Spinners, mate. You can't get better than that in terms of disco soul, can you? Well, yeah, I'll I mean, go with Bob, Bobby Thurston. Check out the groove. These songs they just take me back to being in the youth club at fourteen. Yeah, and the one yeah. that well, I rediscovered it, hearing it for the first time in years, was that Check Out the Groove by Bobby Thurston. There's lots yeah, of good stuff it. like that around. You're just at the time when people are still using real instruments. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and Bad Man oh, yeah. is... So I was going to say, don't, please don't forget the British funk explosion, Light of the World Links, yeah. you know, Agro yeah. Co. We just came in 1980, you know, so we're very lucky to have had those as well. We were. And, and do you relate to the Cockney rejects, the greatest no. Cockney ripoff? No. I didn't think no. so. You know why? Because I haven't uh, had access to them because I, they're not racist, they're not fascist, not in any way. But I look at their attire and I just, I've stepped back when I was a kid. I, I couldn't look at Cockney skinheads, even though they're good guys, you know, I couldn't do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and and musically, it's so, it's so, it's, it's so conservative musically for me. Yeah. Uh, the Jam uh, have got about 10 tracks in the Jam. Yeah. Well, the Jam have just made it big. That. So the entire yeah. back catalogue has been released because they've just ah. made it, they've just had a number one. We're going underground, so the record company are thinking, how can we cash in? I know. For we'll me, let people discover the back catalogue. They were 1977 for me, or just coming maybe into 1978 because they were what we call new wave. Those of us who followed the punk uh, trajectory, and they were a little bit too soft for me at that time. So it may maybe made a lot of sense to re-release their music. Guys, we've run out of time, you know. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, Shekhar, speaking to you, uh, not least about your book, Nam yeah, Namaste Giza. Tell us Namaste more about Giza. 
Yeah, tell us more about the book, yeah, sorry, please. It's out, it's out next week. It's in uh, Waterstones. I've been started selling them. I was actually asked to sign some. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's, got, it's just going to the second reprint already. It's all it's been selling on Amazon well and foils and um, W. So it's it's out. It's selling. It's in. I really think you guys will like it, both of you. I think you'll you'll um, you'll understand me a bit more because I know I sound a bit nutty today. But you know, no, no, give me no, a no. talk. Oh, you don't. So honestly, frame, there's a lot of stuff in there which, Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there which we haven't talked about. But like I'm going to my ex-wife went to one football match, an Asian woman. Um, and she'd never been back, and that was 30 years ago because of the monkey chance. So I go into all that kind of stuff and, um, you know, the joyous West Ham being European champions, Conference League last year. There's, lot, there's lots of stuff in there about school, and, you know, I hope people will read it. And, uh, you know, and, and it's a joyous book, I think, although there are some, you know, very I'm gonna moments. I'm going to put a hat on purely yeah. and simply because I, I then have the opportunity to take my hat off to you because oh, uh, thank you. It's, 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 what's it say on your hat? What's Sorry? it say on your uh, hat? Sports make you lucky. Sports, okay. That's Sports right. is that's hard, though. Okay, that's just right. learning some yeah. Portuguese, yeah. Learn, learning Portuguese, guys. Well, I'll take it out to you because, in, in, order, in order to gather the stuff that you've put in your book, you have had to walk the road less traveled by. And uh, what a story! I'm really looking forward to, to reading my master geezer. Because Thank you uh, it much. seems to me to be a little fable about about our our, our island, uh, yeah, and yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's popular culture and its capacity to include all in its popular culture. It seems to me yeah. there's Thank really you. a story worth telling there. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate and, it. You. And we can always do it again because, as you've already hinted, there's one more West Ham match of recent times that you might want to talk about. Um, and I'm glad that you put the caveat conference when you said European champions. Oh, because I knew you'd do it. Thank you. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. Our guest has been Shekhar Bartia, who's the author of Namaste Giza, Life as a Fan and Journalist of Asian Heritage. Tim, many thanks. Thank you. Why well, as Thank you, you say, obrigado. <laughs>